what I'm talking about is this notion that sex is natural and it's not natural, it's learned, which is why you will see so many different cultures having very different interpretations of what acceptable sex is. These defaults around, well, sex has to be penis and vagina, it has to be between a man and a woman, it has to be, you know, this many times a week. All of these things are cultural stories that have nothing to do with natural sex and everything to do with stuff that validates us and makes us feel like we're normal. I'm Cindy Darnell. Welcome to The Erotic Philosopher, the podcast where we examine and explore sex and relationships through social, personal, cultural, scientific, political and other lenses and unpack and explore your erotic quandaries with the world's wisest erotic philosophers. Hi everyone, it's Cindy Darnell here. I'm back. I'm back in the saddle bringing you season three of The Erotic Philosopher. I have been on hiatus. I I wasn't expecting, to be honest, to be away for as long as I was, but uh, I finished writing a book and you may have noticed The Erotic Philosopher hasn't released any new episodes for almost a year now. And that's why I've been writing a book. And so before I get into that, I just want to preface the season by telling you I have a wonderful lineup of guests for you for this season, talking, of course, about all the things that I like to talk about, sex and relationships, and going in at a, at a deep level. For those of you who, like myself, like to take a deeper dive into, into life, into pleasure, into intimacy, into meaning, into connection, and all of those yummy things, that's where we're going to go this year with the erotic philosopher like previous years so with this first episode i am i am the guest and the host is my dear friend l chase who you may have heard her episode where i interviewed her in season one in this episode l interviews me about my new book sex when you don't feel like it the truth about mismatched libido and rediscovering desire it's coming out in june of 2022 you can pre-order it or you can order it depending on when you're listening to this, head to my website, cindydarnell.com, and you'll see the book tab there with all the info. You know, I wrote this book because libido is, mismatched libido especially, it's such an issue for so many couples. And myself included, I, you know, I had an experience of this myself in a relationship many, many years ago, which really is what inspired my quest to write a book like this because what I discovered and what I was looking for was something more than just the simple kind of, you know, how do you get horny tropes. For those of you who have experienced low desire or perhaps you're the higher desire partner in a relationship with somebody with low desire or perhaps you're the lower desire person and you have a partner who's always saying, hey, you know, let's have sex, let's have sex. And you're like, oh, gosh, that's the last thing on my mind. You know, it's so much more complicated than just being horny or just sort of, you know, being in the mood. There are so many more moving parts. And over 10 years, I researched what the science says, but also, you know, what what works. And I actually in- was interested in speaking to, to people who had navigated the issue and found things that worked for them. And much to, you know, <laughs> my surprise, I guess, at the time, or not really even, was that a lot of the answers that we seek potentially through pills and ointments and, you know, how can I how can I get horny if I eat oysters or if I watermelon under a full moon or whatever some of the other things are that people suggest about getting in the mood. And, you know, the truth is that a lot of that stuff, it just doesn't work because desire is is so much more complex and relational than just am I horny, am I not? There are so many more parts to get through. And that that's what led me to creating this book through the process of, you know, editing and publishing, really taking a big scuba dive into what works, into not just what's wrong with me, what's wrong with you, what's wrong with us, because often there's nothing wrong. There's a problem, but that doesn't mean 
that it, there's something wrong or that this this it's somebody's fault. And so systematically going through the book chapter by chapter, it's a you know it's designed as a workbook to help you work through these issues together. And it's it's also really designed to be used relationally, but also by yourself. I mean, you can use this book on your own. You can use this with your partner. It is the kind of book that's going to help you expand yourself and understand yourself, which ultimately is what helps you bring more to any relationships, be they romantic or friendships. The more of yourself that you know and that you have to offer, the more you can show up intimately. So without further ado, I give you episode one of season three of The Erotic Philosopher. I love having you here and I love having your ears. Enjoy this episode with me and El Chase. Hi, Cindy. Hi, wife of mine. Nice to see you here again. Yes. And uh, we're, uh, we're switching around. This is going to be the first episode of season three of The Erotic Philosopher. Yeah. Oh, yes. And you were, a, you were a guest in season one. I was. I was. about body image and all of these things. And so today we've decided to flip, flip the roles. Yes. And uh, you're going to be interviewing me for the first episode of season three. I am about your fabulous, fabulous book, Sex When You Don't Feel Like It. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. Shall we, shall we jump right into it, my love? I think let's, let's jump right in. Don't make the people wait any Don't longer make than the they have to. Don't people wait. I think what I would like to know, and probably what everybody else would like to know, is why did you decide to write this book? Because... That's a great question because, you know, in the 20 however many years that I've been doing sex and relationships work, the number one issue that couples have, obviously this doesn't affect individuals so much because if you're an individual and you don't feel like having sex, then it doesn't really matter that much because I guess you don't have to. And also you don't have to in a relationship either, just to be clear. But um I wrote this book because when I was, well, when I am working with couples, the most common reason that couples struggle is around mismatched libido and mismatched desire. And it's so normal. I would say that it probably affects 100% of couples. So that's how prevalent this thing is. And it's not a disorder and it's not an illness. It's just a part of life. And that's why I wrote the book to help people understand how to navigate it because it's, you know, desire is not a problem to be solved. It's a quest to be seized. And that is the gist of this book, is that we're not looking at it as a problem. We're looking at it as a relationship to being alive. And so it, in that way, it's sort of like a, a bit of a life manual, this book. You know, life life according to Cindy Darnell. And uh, <laughs> I like that framework, though, because it puts the uh, it, it puts the reader in that position to look for uh, something already within them uh, that can uh, that can make their life better as opposed to something wrong with them that they have to. Like you said, um, you you have said that. uh what is it that everything we've learned about sex is untrue? Um, if I got that correctly. Um, you did. So, so how would you explain that? Because as a sex educator, I think uh, untrue, unnatural. What is that? Yeah. So when I talk about that, what I'm talking about is this notion I guess that sex is natural and it's not natural. It's learned, which is why, you will see so many different cultures having very different interpretations of what acceptable sex is. A lot of it has to do with uh, a default to heterosexuality, even though a lot of people, probably more than half, don't necessarily experience themselves as strictly heterosexual. So that notion even of a heterosexual gay binary is something that is made up. It doesn't necessarily exist in nature. These are things that we have interpreted to help us make sense of what it means to be a sexual person, what it means to be in a relationship, what it means to be, um, you know, having sex. And that 
these defaults around, well, sex has to be penis and vagina. It has to be between a man and a woman. It has to be, you know, this many times a week. It has to end in orgasm for one or both parties. It has to be between two people. It has to be, um, you know, it, it can't that it can't be with one person and and you know a device that that's somehow considered not real sex. That it has to involve genitals. All of these things are cultural stories that have nothing to do with natural sex and everything to do with stuff that validates us and makes us feel like we're normal. Everybody wants to feel normal. Nobody wants to feel abnormal. No one wants to feel like they're on the outside. So even this is true for people who are in, you know, alternative sex communities, whether they're kinky people or they're, you know, queer people or they're people who are polyamorous or people who are in all kinds of, you know, alt sex, let's say, you know, communities. Even these people in that framework, still want to feel normal. They want to feel like they're part of something larger than themselves. They want to have a sense of purpose and meaning behind their sex. And all of this, you know, the the desire to want to fit in, the desire to want to be accepted, I think that's natural. But the way we make sex about these rules and regulations and obligations and expectations and, you know, who it's for and and the fulfilment that we place on it is entirely constructed by how we see ourselves and how the world tells us we should be in order to get by and to to get certain privileges, to get certain permissions. And this, you know, we see this even currently in US legislation, don't say gay, for example, like all of this stuff. I mean, that none of that is natural. This is all culture-based, power-based, politi- politics-based And so when people are like, oh, but sex is natural, when you're with the right person, it just magically happens. It's like bullshit. Bullshit. We have learned all of this. We've absorbed all of this through movies, through TV, through through so many different areas. And because most of us don't get sex education, and if we do, it's rudimentary at best. It's about how to make babies, which is not why people have sex. Then we're left having to fill the gaps ourselves with, you know, shit that we've made up, shit that we've absorbed from the world around us. And this is how we end up in situations where people come to see people like you and me and they say, you know, my partner and I are not having sex. What's wrong with me? Because the implication is that you should be having lots of sex all the time. And some people want to have lots of sex all the time, but a lot of people don't. And of the people who are having lots of sex all the time, we don't even have discussions about whether or not it's satisfying and what makes it satisfying, and that's what this book is about. So in that phrase, everything about sex is lies, everything about sex is untrue, that's what I'm talking about. There is just so much crap that we believe that we have to wade through, and that's sometimes I think what can put a lot of people off in the beginning about doing any work because they don't want to have to, you know, trudge through some of this stuff. But the sooner you do, the sooner you'll get to having a sex life that's fulfilling and nourishing. And so when you're saying sex isn't natural, you're what you are distinguishing then, if I if I am getting this correctly, is the difference between natural and instinct or instinctive and natural mm-hmm. being the construct of natural. Right. Yeah. I mean that what we call natural sex in you know, certainly in Western culture, because this book is written very much through a Western lens. Uh, What's considered to be natural sex in Western culture is primarily reproductive sex. It's primarily penis and vagina sex. It's primarily uh, spontaneous, just comes out of the blue. And in, in Western culture, it's very heavily linked to romance. None of those things are natural. They are all culturally encouraged and endorsed, you know, even especially, you know, for women, it's this whole thing of, you know, don't give it up until you've met the one and, you know, don't do anything unless you're in a relationship. And if you do, it's because you're easy and all this sort of hoo-ha, you know, this is all stuff that that is the cultural piece. So what I think what is sort of a naturally occurring incentive is that people will feel curious about sex. I think that's natural. Um, I think, you know, at times horniness 
is natural. I think wanting to feel sexual is natural. But the execution and the navigating of rules that we have to do to, to make the link between these different parts of our body, mind and heart, that stuff is not natural. That's very, very heavily constructed. And is that's where people suffer, is trying to make sense of all these rules. So do you think, I mean, I came up in the time of, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, um, reading that in my 20s. Uh, and 30s. And that became sort of the Bible for relationships and uh, heterosexual male and female romance, dating, mating culture. So how how do you how do we take that and rework it into something that is much more uh much more usable and to be honest, uh much more applicable to who we are today as a society. Um, and what did what did John Gray get wrong about men are from Mars, women are from Venus? Men like to feel appreciated, but women like to, you know, feel nurtured or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't even remember what it was. But I mean, the fact that he was able to, you know, and relatively successfully, actually, um, create these you know, uh, containers that were based on stereotypes of the time um, that gave us explanations into why so many heterosexual couples struggled with relationships. And it was a very useful tool at the time to explain a social problem by placing the onus on something like you know, uh, chromosomes and, and gender without, or sex rather, I should not say gender, chromosomes and sex rather than how we raise boys and girls to, to be different, how the idea of men's sexuality being affirmed through their masculinity and women's sexuality being an adjunct simply to men's sexuality, that women's sexuality on its own was not really even considered especially important. It was just men's sexuality light. We have in the last 30 years through science and through culture realised that those definitions that worked to support a society that benefited from having very distinct gender roles and now, as especially with the younger generations coming up, that's getting more and more fuzzy and, and, the, and the space between so-called men and so-called women and masculinity and femininity is starting to become a lot more fluid and loose, that's starting to create new dynamics in the way that we can relate, especially when it comes to, to what, ha what happens in the bedroom. And we are finding that... You know, men don't always want to be initiators. Women don't always want to be passive and submissive. Orgasms matter to some people some of the time, but it's not always the sole incentive, nor is it the primary measure of what makes sex good. And more and more people now are coming out as kinky. More and more people are coming out as bisexual. More and more people are coming out as gender fluid. Those people also have, um, you know, mismatched libido, mismatched desires in their relationships. And that's not because of gender. That's because we are still navigating, well, what does it mean to be sexually attracted to somebody while simultaneously being in a monogamous relationship? What does it mean to have multiple attractions to multiple genders? And then how do we navigate the balance of sex in relationships that exist like that? These are the contemporary questions that certainly are not even part of that whole mindset of men are from Mars, women are from Venus. People weren't thinking like that at the time. They are starting to think like that more. And where low libido, so-called low libido, used to be considered a woman's problem, what we're discovering now is that low libido exists across the gender spectrum. High libido exists across the gender spectrum. So it's not unlikely that people are going to find themselves in relationships with people who have a different desire style or a different, you know, a different level of expectation around libido. And so this book, to my knowledge, 
is the first of its kind that actually goes into desire as as a, 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 you know a quality of the human condition rather than something that is invented and and shoved into boxes of you know boy girl man woman it's much more expansive and much more permissive than that so i'm hoping that it it really reaches a wide audience through, just through that alone on that note i often hear and i'm sure you do too uh the conflation of desire and libido um, is there a difference? And if there is, uh, how do they both play into a sexually satisfying relationship with another person? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know that there is a clinical definition of the two of them. I think they do tend to get thrown around together and, and you can use them interchangeably, I think. When I talk about libido, I talk about the sensation we generally refer to as horniness. That's what I mean by libido. It's a bit more animally, it's a bit more primal, it's a bit more in the belly, and it's it, it feels very visceral. Desire, to my interpretation, is when we also start to combine the imagination, the sensuality, the longing, the interpersonal element. That is the bit that I that's what I make the distinction between desire and libido. Other clinicians probably have different uh, definitions, but that was the working definition that I have. And it's also sort of why I've got both of the words in the title of the book, because I am talking about libido, but I'm also talking about desire. And it's not just, you know, how can I be more horny? Because, you know, you can you can be horny and have very unsatisfying sex. It doesn't matter, you know. And, and we tend to put such an extraordinary emphasis on horniness in our culture that, again, leaves people feeling really empty because horniness is unreliable for a lot of people. And, and can feel uh, horniness is, is, like you said, primal and in, in the stomach and doesn't um, take into account um, human connection. Right. Right. And I mean, and that you can even have, you know, human connection in, in a hookup and a one night stand. This doesn't only exist in long term partnerships, but the difference is for people who are having hookups. If you need to take a break for a little while from hooking up because you've lost your libido and you're not in the mood, it, you're, you know, the, the stakes are pretty low on that. It doesn't really matter. You're not necessarily going to have somebody kind of, you know, threatening you with divorce if you don't you know, put out. Whereas for people in long-term relationships, this mismatch thing can be a bit more detrimental because for some people it can be a deal breaker in relationships. And so before folks get to a point of having, you know, the deal breaker conversation, I want to invite them to systematically work through this book chapter by chapter because it's a workbook. There are, you know, it's all it's very practical. There's a lot of theory in there, but there's also a lot of exercises. So, you know, this is what the science says. This is what culture says. This is what I say as an individual. And here are some activities and reflections for you to do by yourself and together with your partner to understand, to learn how to communicate more about what's happening within you to recognize that if you don't feel horny and your partner does, it doesn't mean you don't love them, you know. I mean, it might have something to do with that, but often it doesn't. And before anyone starts calling divorce lawyers, work through this book first. <laughs> um, yeah, no kidding. Um, so what do you say to people in relationships who once had a robust uh robust feelings of desire and libido and now they've been in it for years and it's it's gotten stale or the sex has stopped or they feel like they're more like roommates or friends than anything else but they want to get back to that place of of wanting sex with their partner again how do you what it, what's the first thing you tell people that come to you um to start to stoke that again you need to, for the first thing is that you need to recognize that there is a, is a problem. A lot of people attempt to solve a problem without identifying what the problem is. And the way that this book is structured is it helps you as an individual work out what is happening or not happening in your relationship so you can then 
work out what's happening and not happening within you. So in part, you can take a little bit more responsibility for your end of the deal. So if you're the lower desire partner, things that you can do to level up a little bit. And if you're the higher desire partner, things that you can do to, to bring it down a little bit. Because also there is this thing in mismatched libido that there's something wrong with the low desire partner. That's the implication is the low one is the problem one. I don't take that position. This is about a combined effort. We're looking at it through a relational lens. So it's us two together, not me versus you, not how can I come to your side of the side of the fence, but how can we change? Maybe we need to change the fence. Maybe we need to pull the fence down. But it's teaching people together how to relate to the problem as a problem rather than you're fucked, I'm fucked, you know, we're fucked. No. We start to look at this as a problem that exists between us relationally rather than something that's anybody's fault. When we take the blame out of sex, so many more possibilities open up. So that's the first place that people start from in this book is recognising no one is to blame and everyone's responsible. And that, I think, is still a pretty revolutionary idea for a lot of people when it comes to sex, because again, you know, this idea of it's natural, if you love me, you would want to fuck me. Who said that? Where is this? This is not, I mean, this is, you know, this is just, we absorb this through Hollywood, through Disney, through porn, through all kinds of places. We just absorb it, absorb it, absorb it to the point that we believe it. And we have no other reflective framework to, to critique it against. And so then we start to internalise it. You know, we start to believe it and we think maybe there is something wrong with me. Maybe there's something wrong with you. Maybe, you know, maybe we're not well suited. Maybe this is the end of the road for us, you know, and, and maybe it is the end of the road. This is not a, you know, this is not a, a conflict management manual, but if the relationship is ostensibly pretty good and the sex is the part that's the problem. This book is really the guide to, to help you at least get started on the road with navigating and, and identifying actually what the problem is because it might not be nearly as catastrophic as you think it is. Often it's not. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then for people who are not coupled, uh, I remember coming to you um, in in perimenopause and saying, "I have no desire. I don't. I don't. Uh, you know, I don't want any sex. I don't want this. I'm worried that that's it for me." And I think one of the revolutionary things that you said to me was, "When you think about the partner that you would like to have, do you think that you would be interested in sex?" And I'm like, "Oh yeah, you know," and so. You were like, you know, rethink this. So I think that people who are um, who have their libido, their desire um, tamped down by hormones or by medication or just by frame of mind, how to quiet their mind a bit. Um, how might they start to tackle that? And what actually can it be tackled? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it can. So when when the lack of desire is sort of physiologically driven, so when it's hormonally based, when it's, um, you know, contextually based, say, you know, you've lost your job or you're, uh, you've been unwell through no fault of your own, you've had some sort of chronic long-term illness or you are in perimenopause or you are... Um, you know, just in a in a stage in your life where you're depressed or, you know, any of these things, you know, shit happens. I mean, I say this to my clients, bad things happen to good people all the time. You know, you're grieving, anything, anything like this, you lost your job. All of this stuff can affect what, you know, spontaneous desire might be there. It's okay to go through periods of time where you're just not interested in sex. What we know from the research, um, especially around hormones and menopause, is that if prior to menopause you were a kind of mostly lusty person, once the crux, uh, you know, the, 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 the most visceral kind of unpleasant part of perimenopause is over and menopause is over and your hormones start balancing out again, for a lot of people, 
the desire comes back. The horniness does tend to come back. This is what the science tells us. So, you know, for some people, it is just a matter of writing it out if it is purely physiological. In my experience of working with desire, my own and other people's, the physiological element is probably the least important element. And the vast majority majority of it has to do with changing the context, changing the way you talk about it, changing the way you think about it, changing the way you interact with it. And all of that stuff can be done, you know, gradually over time. So as a solo person who is thinking, I don't feel like having sex, I know I never want to have sex again. Uh, you know, I don't even want to masturbate. I just, I don't want, you know, if I never have any sexual anything for the rest of my life and I'm genuinely okay with that, I would say, good, all power to you. You don't have to have sex. You never have to have sex with anyone ever if you don't want to. But if you're recognising that you're in a bit of a patch, you can see in your life that how you're feeling and what's going on for you is, is you know, kind of unique. In the history of your life, this is sort of an unusual stage that you're in trust that physiologically your body will come back into some kind of equilibrium and while your body is doing whatever it needs to do in order to calibrate and make sense of the changes that are going on physically emotionally you know hormonally psychologically whatever do your work around managing the other parts of your life that you do have control over and that sometimes can be incentive enough for people who are feeling a bit lackluster. And, you know, and I think also too, you know, if you're in one of these sort of dry spells, masturbation is a great practice. It's especially, you know, even if you don't feel like it, it once you start sometimes, if it's okay, if you and you have some good toys and some good lube and some good whatevers, sometimes that can be enough to kickstart at least some sort of relationship with your body that is centering sex and pleasure until, you know, your little your little dry spell comes back. Everybody has dry spells. You're not going to be a sex machine 24-7. No yeah, it's no just, having a, a no. dry spell for, you know, a couple of months or even a couple of years, That's it's not the it's not the death knell. I think everybody panics like, oh, my God, you know, and it's it's not how it is. It, sex is, you know, it's I often describe it as it's more like water then it is like fire. It comes and goes, it dries up, you know, sometimes it freezes, it heats up, and, you know, it gets in between all the nooks and crannies if we allow it to do its job. If we try and stymie it and and we panic when it's not doing what we think it's supposed to do, then that's where we end up causing ourselves so much distress and it needn't be that way. I'm thinking, too, that when it comes to desire uh, and libido in your framework, the paradigm that you have for it. Um, I am noticing uh, after this COVID situation uh, that people are really, really jonesing for connection. That not only do they have this skin hunger from lack of touch, but they have a, a... a heart hunger, I suppose, um, a, a desire to connect with people and that intermingles with their uh, libido, with their horniness. Um, is that something that you've seen? Is that something that you feel you need in order to have desire with your partner um, or in order for you to have a satisfying sex life if you're single? Um, and If so, can you make the argument for, and I agree, by the way, with you can have a connection with someone you're hooking up with, whether you know someone for 10 minutes or 10 years, you can have a connection. So how do we do that? How do we take care of that? Um, And do we need to uh, rethink what connection means to us and its relation to who we are sexually? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think connection comes in so many forms and, you know, one of the other areas of interest that I have outside of libido is, um, you know, creating relationships that are nourishing, 
whether they're sexual or not sexual. I think we disproportionately put way too much emphasis on romantic relationships in our culture. I think that's really, in fact, I one of my predictions is that we will start to decentralise the power of romantic relationships as the sole place we go to get our relational nourishment because romantic relationships are notoriously fickle. Romantic relationships that involve sex are even more fickle than that. Um, And when we place all of our eggs into that sex romance basket and end up with an omelette, then... (laughs) We, you know, it's really on us to go, well, maybe I'm not the problem. Maybe you are not the problem. Maybe the model is the problem, you know. So I think, you know, the more we start learning how to develop relational intelligence, the more we start learning how to develop emotional intelligence, and the more we can start widening our circle of connection to include friends, to include Um, you know, platonic partners to include, you know, networks of people that we can turn to, that we can rely on and that, you know, especially with the skin hunger thing, you can touch your friends or your friends can touch you. Maybe not necessarily intimately, like, I mean, sexually, as in touching each other's genitals. I mean, you can if you want to. Some people be like, yeah, that's a bit icky for me. But, you know, hugging, sleeping in the same bed, you know, stroking each other's hair, giving each other massages, that's, you know, you can do that, particularly, you know, queer folks and, and women tend to already do that. I think the people who tend to actually struggle with that part the most is cis men, especially straight cis men, um, because... For a lot of straight cis guys, the only touch they get is through sex. They don't get any touch of any other kind, and I think they really are the ones who struggle and suffer most with this, which is sometimes why they can really come on very strong to, especially to female partners, about I need sex, I need you to touch me, because it is literally the only outlet they get for touch. And this, again, is a social problem. This is not Uh, an individual problem this is a social problem but it is up to the individuals involved to navigate the social problem by widening the context and finding other ways to get skin hunger met and and nourished and because there's a taboo around dudes touching each other and I think it's lessening I think it is getting better but um, there is still a taboo around straight men touching each other and and you know, that it, it puts a disproportionate emphasis, emphasis then on the women in their lives to, you know, to have to do that for them as well. And it's it's too much, you know, it's really too much. And also simultaneously, um, heterosexual cis women are really starting to centre their own pleasure now and saying, well, you know what, I don't want to touch you all the time. Sometimes I want you to touch me and I want you to touch me in a way that is, you know, joyful and beneficial for me, not in a way that brings you pleasure but in a way that brings me pleasure. And this is also flipping the script. And so my book goes into that discussion as well around using um, the model from the Wheel of Consent, Betty Martin's model about who is this for and really sort of driving home this notion that we have to change the way we think about touch and connection as not necessarily being this gimme, 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 and we're just, you know, wandering around like hungry ghosts, perpetually unsatisfied and empty and hungry, that there are actually so many ways we can get skin hunger met if we are willing to shift the way we relate to touch and intimacy to expand our circle a little bit. And this is, again, coming back to that whole thing, everything we've been told about sex is lies. This is another one. I can only get my physical needs met through my partner. Why? Who told you that? You know, it's awkward initially to start changing that sort of physical dynamic with friends who you've probably never sort of touched in your life. But with conversation, with communication, and maybe there's a certain section of your friendship group that you're like, oh, no, no, they're too square, they're too conservative, they would never be into this. But then maybe you meet new friends who are interested in doing the same things and you can, you know, have regular meetups where you just swap massages with each other. It doesn't have to be raunchy unless you want it to be. That can be really, really nourishing for people. And to me, 
you know, that kind of sensuality is is as powerful as as more explicit erotic sensuality for those who are willing to go there. And this is where it really, it so much of it comes about, you know, reframing that these problems that we have as individuals and recognising that a lot of these are social problems and we have the power to change them. Um, that actually segues into what my next question was going to be about is um, you talk about erotic playfulness um, in your book. And um, I'm wondering how one thinks about that uh, and and exploring that and how that compares to sensuality, being sensual, sensual playfulness, or is it the same thing? Um, if it's not, how do they intersect? Um, but I really do like this idea that you have of this expansive idea of, of erotic playfulness, um, that, that will stoke your ideas and your, uh, and your desires. Um, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, erotic playfulness, I think, you know, to me, it's, it's that willingness to be able to, to play and and I think you know a lot of us as children would you know play with our siblings or friends or whoever was around us and you know even if we had complicated sort of you know fucked up childhoods which I know a lot of people did I certainly did there were still there still would have been, you know, one maybe or two people who you would just play with, whether it was, you know, inside, outside at school, you know, op, op, just ways that you could, you know, release your imagination and and just somehow enjoy yourself, not in a sexual way, just, just play for play's sake, you know, being able to be in relationship with the world, even with a pet, if you didn't have human friends when you were a child, maybe you had a pet. Or maybe just your imagination. Maybe you were able to escape in a world of books and drawings and things as a child. It's that kind of playfulness, that kind of interest and wonder in what's possible that I invite people to cultivate again. And a lot of adults have lost connection with that part of themselves. It's almost like, you know, we get to sort of, start noticing maybe around the age of 10 or 12 that we have to start being part of a society and in order to start being part of a society we have to start behaving in a certain way in order to get some of the privileges that society offers some people we have to toe the line we either have to you know remain slim and pretty and quiet or we have to beef up and bulk up and get money and get acquisitions or all of these rules that come with you know gaining power in in our culture and the price that we pay for any of those things, whichever point of the spectrum or that you may slide up and down along, the price of admission in that sort of social context is it means that we have to give up some of our playfulness, some of our curiosity, some of our gentleness. And that's one of the terrible losses, I think, of adulthood is we get adult privilege, meaning we get to do what we like more or less within reason on our on our watch but if we also want to have social collateral and social power we have to give up certain parts of ourselves and those parts that we give up are often the parts that we need to have erotic playfulness and so when i invite people to come back to erotic playfulness it's connecting to that childlike quality that they had at one time that may have been you know thrust out of them through trauma, through, uh, you know, social um, rising up the social ladder, through obligation, through religion, through there's lots and lots of reasons that we lose touch with our playfulness and it's often because we're exchanging that in order to acquire something else, safety, power, something. And when we are back in a state of equilibrium as adults and we have adult privilege to be able to choose who and what and how we do sex, do relationships and do certain things like that, that's when we can then start bringing the, the compass back to go, huh, 
So the bit of me that I lost touch with when I was four, five, six years old, that part that used to enjoy playing with my dog or playing outside or playing, you know, whatever the games I used to enjoy playing, not that you necessarily want to go and, you know, play out on the jungle gym again, but that feeling of, oh, my gosh, I can't wait to, you know, fill in the blank, that is the magic that I want to invite people to come back to. Where is that excitement for you? Where is that joy for you? What can you imagine yourself wanting to feel again, not necessarily wanting to do, but wanting to feel again to orient you back into this place where you can even imagine that that kind of joy is possible again? And that that has a lot to do too with being curious. And and You can't have that without curiosity. Yeah, yeah. Um, And I would also imagine, too, within that, there would be an element of novelty sometimes that might come to mind to be playful. Um, You know, sexual fantasies. How do how do those play a role in beefing up a relationship's um, uh, sex life? for lack of a better term, or even a single person's desire to be sexual. Some people don't know that they're kinky until they see something and they go, hmm. Yeah, well, some people don't know that they're kinky until they do something. And then, you know, at the, you know when they think about it, they conceptualize it. I mean, I remember the first time I, um, I received bondage was, gosh, many, many years ago. And uh, anyway, and and at the time, you know, the person that I was with didn't ask me if it was okay, which, you know, in current parlance would be absolutely unacceptable. That said, it was somebody who I really trusted, who I had a very strong connection with, and it was fine. Anyhow, he took the initiative and he just did it. And I went along with it because I felt safe and I trusted him at the time. And I still to this day, I think that was one of the best sexual experiences I ever had. If he had said to me in advance, you know, would you be interested in it? I probably still would have said yes anyway, but I would have had no comprehension of whether or not I wanted to do it because I'd never done it before. And I couldn't possibly imagine how it would feel in the same way that if I were to ask, you know, you have you know have you ever had Ethiopian food do you want to try it and you'd be like oh I don't know I've never had it and then I say to you well it's spicy and you eat it with your fingers and you're like what the really oh no I don't think I'm into that but then accidentally you come across Ethiopian food and you eat it and you're like oh my god this is delicious yeah I totally am into this you wouldn't know unless you were willing to try it this is the thing sometimes with certain you know, activities in our minds when we conceptualize them, we think, oh, no, I would never want to do that. But when we do it and we notice that our body goes, oh, my God, I'm really into this, we discover that, wow, actually I'm really into being tied up or I'm really into tying somebody up or I'm really into this and that. And you might not even know that you're into it unless you try it once, try it twice, try it three times. And this is also where I think we need to start expanding our conversations around consent because we can't always know in advance if we're going to like something or not like something. And sometimes there has to be willingness. But that's where I go into this a lot in the book. How do we structure these conversations? How do we explore possibilities in a way that keep us fundamentally safe, but also in ways that allow us to take risks, including fantasies and that kind of stuff. So. And that would have to do too with sort of reprogramming your brain then to think about sex and desire differently. And yeah, not your brain so much, but reprogramming how you think about sex, how you feel about it, how you talk about it. And and then that will ultimately change your, your brain, like your actual brain, if, if that matters to you. But um, how our brains work and how our sex works it, it, they certainly there's interplay there but what happens in our brains is is a lot less important i think than people think that we're just yeah. these brains sorry on... i i misspoke i meant mind as opposed oh, to oh no 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 that's okay no just because there's a whole chapter in the book about brain science and and um i do go into that quite heavily about the role of the brain in sex and 
I explain how it works and I, you know, I taught people talk about dopamine and all this kind of stuff and I bust a whole lot of myths that, again, people believe about the importance of sex and the brain and, you know, porn addiction and all this hoo-ha. Um, I talk about all of that stuff too. Yeah, oh, porn addiction is a huge, a huge topic at the moment, I think. Um, all right, well, thank you, Cindy. Thank you, wife. I thoroughly enjoyed this discussion and um, I'm, I'm really glad that you enjoyed my book. And I, I love your book. And in fact, in fact, uh, I have recommended it to just about a million people and I sing it already, 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 already it hasn't even I, come out yet. It hasn't come out yet, but you know, I've read it. So uh, it's already informed um informs my work and I'm a professional, so I can just imagine the uh, impact it's going to have on the layperson. And uh, I just, I, I just think it's one of those books that's going to be a perennial favorite um, in the same way that Come As You Are is by Emily Nagoski. Oh, wow. Thank you. Well, let's hope so. And then that was certainly a game changer for a lot of people. And yeah, there's definitely a lot of useful crossover, I think, from that book in terms of its role for vulva owners and women and sort of this is, you know, maybe the next step along the journey for people who are of all genders and all orientations wanting to really take a rich, rich dive into the nature of desire and libido and work out, you know, what the fuck is going on with me, with you, with us, and how can we make it as good as we can make it without feeling like, dragging a ball and chain around so yeah thanks wife thank you my love thanks wife my interview with l chase go ahead and order my book and i'd love to get your feedback about it you can drop me your feedback through my website which is cindydarnell.com while you're there of course that's the home of the erotic philosopher you'll find the podcast tab there featuring this episode and all the previous episodes and all the future episodes are going to hang out there too and one of the ways this season that I would really love to invite you to support the show is by leaving us a rating and review on iTunes your ratings and reviews boost our visibility they make our show and our discussions accessible to people who wouldn't normally find them these ratings and reviews really matter so if you can spare couple of minutes take the link to itunes even if you don't listen on itunes leave a rating leave us a review and i will be deeply appreciative of your support and encouragement for future episodes while you're on my website check out the online pleasure school there's a suite of online courses there ready for you to take in the privacy of your own home i'll be bringing more to you throughout the year go ahead and look around there's something there for everybody you can also follow us on social media we are at the erotic philos that's p-h-i-l-o-s on instagram and twitter and i am also on instagram and twitter at cindy underscore darnell that's c-y-n-d-i underscore d-a-r-n-e-l-l it's been great to be back in the saddle for episode one of season three and i look forward to joining you again next week or next time with more episodes of the erotic philosopher until then take care